Hi, I'm Rob Hadley in Vancouver. I'm going to talk to you today about integrating spirituality into your clinical practice. And don't forget, you can find out a little bit more about what I talk about today and some of my other training modules at robhadley.ca. One day, 14 years ago, a client walked into my office with a rash around the base of her neck. She told me she couldn't understand why, but she would get a rash on her skin each time she tried to wear any kind of necklace. My initial thought was that she had some form of eczema or dermatitis. However, this rash was very localized and seemed to happen regardless of the type of necklace. After taking an extensive history, nothing really supported the idea. Nonetheless, I decided to go ahead working on the basis that perhaps the cause would emerge in the course of the therapy. You can imagine I was surprised when the client, once in hypnosis, spontaneously went into a past life experience. This concluded with a particularly lurid situation that included a garroting in a dark wood at the hands of several men. Working through the trauma of this past life and resolving it, we wrapped up the session. I was left a little puzzled, but expected that we'd learn more in the subsequent sessions scheduled with the client. In the follow-up sessions, my client would arrive wearing a necklace and has never had a recurrence of the rashes that had previously plagued her. I can't complain about this, though it wasn't really how I expected things to play out, but a win is a win and I wasn't going to pass it up. At the time, my practice was firmly rooted in the conservative model of clinical hypnotherapy. My clients were lawyers, bankers, and tech professionals in a busy affluent city. Most of my advertising was pitched squarely at this market. Our clients would arrive from their offices in their suits and would expect us to reflect their professionalism. I particularly remember one bank manager clutching his head and saying, if one more client comes in and tells me they're manifesting a way to repay their line of credit. This market firmly believed that talk of a higher power referred to power lines or possibly the tax department. To start trotting out talk of past lives, universal consciousness and astral projection would likely undermine most of the client relationships. Yet, as buttoned up as some of these suits were, even in the glass-fronted office towers of downtown Vancouver, there remains a strange stirring. As busily as people are chasing little green pieces of paper, there's also something undefined that most people seem to search for. It's as though they can't really figure it out, but they feel the absence of it. One client came to me almost breaking down and saying, I feel a hunger in my soul that nothing seems to satisfy. I stifled the temptation to say that it's probably the MSG in the food and put on my best game face. Although I may sound a little flippant about it, there really does seem to be something missing in our lives these days. It plays out in some interesting ways, which we see in our work. My specialization has always been addictions and eating disorders. This puts me in touch with some interesting people. Within the substance abuse group, there are some who might be classified as searching for something. For these people, the drug serves as part of this search. The term mind-expanding drugs refers directly to this. For some people, LSD and other psychoactive drugs of its type are an effort to find something beyond the office window. Life's not short of addictive habits and substances that people fall into. However, the substance itself is not as important as the reasons they use it. And there we find the search often for a higher meaning in life. It's entirely unsurprising to me that many of my drug dependency clients have also been on a search for their higher selves. The journey to India, a year spent in an ashram, or in more than one case, falling foul of a cult. These are all stories that have a familiar ring. I don't want to oversimplify this, so I have to point out that not all drugs follow this model. Cocaine is a pleasure drug. It's what some might think of as a lower chakra drug. There are, however, other drugs that affect people very differently, and some might even say they do expand the mind. There's good reason some drugs are referred to as the food of the gods. Was the first primate to look up at the stars, stand on their hind legs and howl at the moon, high on mushrooms? Well, quite possibly they were. Many types of psychedelic mushrooms containing hallucinogens, 
such as psilocybin, are present in the Rift Valley and areas we describe as the cradle of mankind. So in working with my clients, I have learned to tune my ears for the code words that suggest they are open to therapies that might be as spiritually driven as they are clinically driven. These two approaches are far from mutually exclusive. In fact, the two approaches often complement one another. I'll get into the specifics of a couple of techniques in a moment, but before we get there, I'd like to go slightly further into the question of how one presents this type of practice from a marketing perspective. When I ran Vancouver Hypnotherapy, a well-established practice with six therapists and agreements with local medical professionals, there were limits to what one could bring into the therapy room. This simply wasn't the kind of practice one could present in a shamanistic way without driving away the core market. Leaving Vancouver Hypnotherapy, I was able to shift focus a little. I live in a part of the city that's full of yoga studios, has a healthy alternative healthcare tradition, and is very liberal in nature. When people started panic buying at the start of the pandemic, there was actually a run on kombucha in the local Whole Foods, something that led to some particularly ugly accusations of hoarding at a nearby yoga studio. The people I'm marketing to are new age, neo-shamanistic, and prepared to back it up with dollars from a credit union that promotes itself as very ethically sound. As a single practitioner, I'm able to focus my marketing on this group. While I still enjoy a good relationship with Vancouver Hypnotherapy, and Gary Blaney, who runs it far better than I ever did, and I still go out for a coffee once a week or so with her, I now provide a slightly more nuanced type of hypnotherapy. It's a different audience here, and a different approach. In this instance, a more esoteric approach is precisely what my audience is looking for. we all want our practices to be financially successful. However, we should also acknowledge that this is a very unusual type of work. It does require an intimacy at a psychological level that few vocations share. Sometimes we quite literally are in the head of our client, and sometimes that's not a very nice place to be. So whatever we're doing, we better be sure we like it. It should be something we believe in. Simply earning a few more dollars is not going to satisfy you two decades down the road. It's very likely that if you're a person who's remotely spiritual, you're going to want to integrate a few aspects of esoteric hypnosis into your practice eventually. Otherwise, you're going to be one of the people experiencing that hunger, and it's got nothing to do with MSG. The real skill here is in knowing how to broach the subject and how to recognize the client that's going to be open to these approaches. This isn't going to come to you from an online form in which you ask, what's your spiritual position? In your initial talks with a client, the phone inquiry, for example, the client is interviewing you every bit as much as you're interviewing them. You probably don't want to introduce anything that might induce them to drop the phone and call the next person on their list. A better approach is to ask very open questions. Let the client talk. In the years I've been training hypnotherapists, if there are four important words every hypnotherapist needs to hear, it is those four. Let the client talk. Listen carefully for the choice of words, the language, and even the way the words are spoken. You'll see clues to their spiritual position. Gradually, you can work the discussion around to spirituality if you feel comfortable, and if they feel comfortable, going in those directions. Did you enjoy school? Did you ever go to Sunday school? Were your parents religious? Is that a part of your life? Sometimes these questions draw short one-word replies, and likely that's not going to be the right client to progress with an overtly esoteric approach. That's not to say you can't introduce some aspects of spirituality in the therapy. You just may need to go a little bit lightly on it. Before we go any further, I'd like to throw in an aside 
that's come up recently. During COVID, we did see some polarization in society around healthcare. The phrase, I believe in science, has been trotted out quite frequently. You and I know very well hypnosis is well established at a scientific level. However, some of our clients are unaware of this, and careless phrasing of what we offer can feed into their own lack of knowledge and their doubt. So as we go forward and COVID slips behind us, presenting ourselves with professionalism is increasingly important. But can we be both spiritual and scientific in our approach? Yes, we can, as you'll see in a moment. I believe it's a matter of how we use the tools at our disposal. When we see clients today, depending where you live and how liberal the culture is, people are generally more accepting of hypnosis than they were 50 or 60 years ago. People are more informed. The media talks more about hypnosis, sometimes positively and sometimes negatively, but one way or another there's more acceptance than there was in the past. Spirituality has changed too. People are quite happy drawing on Christian, Hindu or New Age ideas to form their own blended beliefs. These informal theologies don't incorporate the boundaries that more traditional religions involve and people are more comfortable with that. As hypnotists, this can be very helpful to us. Just as we can't hypnotize a subject to do things they really don't wish to, when we speak the same language as our subject, metaphorically speaking, it becomes very easy to hypnotize them. Understanding what makes them tick helps us deliver powerful and even life-changing sessions with clients. Most people who come to hypnotists, and in many cases who go to other alternative healthcare practitioners, are educated and well-informed. They tend to be people with an inquiring mind. These very same people are the ones who are self-aware enough to ask the big questions. Yet, those same big questions are often the ones that are most difficult to talk with others about. In serving our clients, making ourselves available at this level, we provide a connection that can greatly help in the way we deliver therapy. The argument that spiritual matters are unscientific isn't really true in our case. Very likely you've done past life regressions which have yielded surprising and positive results. Or perhaps you've used one of Jerry Kine's ultra height techniques, very, very effective systems. Jerry did some very creative hypnosis which is easily adapted into new age practices. If it's an evidence-based approach one's looking for, there's no doubt that clients have made remarkable improvements to their life following these types of sessions. And yet there is some skepticism associated with spirituality generally. The way I put it to people who are a little unsure about it is this. I don't really understand how a cell phone works. I can be fairly sure there's no demon inside it who's shouting to another demon in the phone of the person I'm calling. But, in spite of the fact I don't know how it really works, I can still use my cell phone without too much trouble. Equally, we may not really know why past life regression works, but we do see the results. Whatever your own position or belief I think we can all agree that we're, we're on our own particular journey and our client is on theirs. We don't have to agree or condone their personal theology to be able to work with it. So who is coming to see us and use these services? Much the same as it's always been. People with anxiety or insomnia, people with chronic pain or an addiction. These approaches are simply more tools with which to resolve the problems. It's relatively rare for someone to come specifically to experience past life regression. There's generally a good reason, and something other than idle curiosity is usually involved. Not that there's really anything wrong with that. In the past, when people experience bouts of anxiety or depression, they'd go, likely as not, to their priest, not their doctor. Equally, in many parts of the world, when searching for guidance, someone struggling might go to a shaman. As hypnotherapists, we are fortunate to exist in the middle ground between these options, from both a practical and business perspective, this gives us some interesting options. Let's talk about past lives for a moment. There's many people who would contend that this is not a valid scientific approach to therapy at all. And yet these same individuals would acknowledge that we carry the DNA of our biological ancestors. We have often framed past life regressions as something we don't really understand but that is likely rooted in some aspect of genetic memory. For example, a horse doesn't need to be taught to be afraid of a snake. Oh, but that's instinct, some people will reply. Very well, but what is instinct when it's not been taught? A set of inherited survival skills? 
Inherited from what? It seems perfectly possible that these values and beliefs, survival or otherwise, come from a previous life, possibly carried in our DNA. No, it's not quite the same as Cleopatra's favoured slave in a past life, but it's getting a little closer. In fact, we likely carry DNA from many thousands of lives before you and I emerged. Why should we not have some beliefs that are carried forward to us? Certainly, generational trauma seems a well-established quality. Why should we not carry forward other experiences? And in a trance state, when memory is easily accessed, it seems quite plausible that some of these memories might emerge. Regardless, we don't need to really know how it works to realize it does work. So the value of past life therapies may not be understood, but regardless, it has value. Most of us that have used past life therapy with clients will have unusual success stories. We may even think we know how it works. I've read some very thick books about this. I have to confess, I prefer to reduce this down to the simple strokes. I don't think it needs to be complicated at all. We help the client achieve trance. We explore a past life. We resolve it and return to consciousness. We then discuss the experience and see if it relates in any specific manner to the client's current situation. I need hardly say that the number of times the client is acting out cycles of the previous life as though the lessons of that life have not been learned is quite remarkable. I know that we can sometimes find things that support our own beliefs as we examine a client's past life experience. Confirmation bias is a thing, as they say. I try to keep a check on this tendency, though, as best I can. This is something you need to be vigilant about. After all, your client is placing a great deal of trust in you. If they believe you're steering things governed by your beliefs, then they'll interpret the session as being all about you and not them. As you talk about their past life experience, ask them questions about it. Explore it. In doing so, the client will speak their interpretation and create for themselves the solutions they need. I should emphasize that you're not going to try to convince a client of the value of a past life regression. The client really has to be there already. Skepticism kills good therapy. So select your client carefully when using these tools. While they don't have to be devoutly following the path of the one true crocodile god, they should be open to the idea of past lives and other spiritual possibilities and interested in such ideas. Keep in mind the one thing worse than working with a skeptic is working with a zealot. So let's just think about tarot cards for a moment. And I know that not everyone is particularly into this, but from a perspective of hypnotherapy, actually you could use almost any image and some oracle decks, some people like those. It just happens that the tarot decks are full of archetypes that are really very easy for people to relate to. Now if you've never seen a tarot deck, the first time you look at the images, they can seem a little simplistic. However, for... A hypnotist, these images are actually very powerful. Sometimes you can see the client relates to the situation or character within a card if they're searching through the deck and maybe selecting some. When you allow the client to flick through a deck and select a few cards, they're actually engaging with the cards. In a sense, they're moving towards some, some element of compliance from a hypnotherapy point of view. Now, Carl Jung talked about how tarot cards can be used with clients as they reflect the archetypes the clients relate to. Now, don't mistake this for divination. That's not what we're doing here. In a sense, the client is actually communicating when they select a few cards that perhaps reflect their situation or characters, people in their life. I usually steer the client towards one single card after we've talked a few about a few of the cards they've selected. Uh, something which represents their situation is always a good thing. And I have a pretty good idea about their background, as we'll have done ex an extensive pre-talk, and I will have a detailed history of the client. 
From time to time I'll suggest a card, though generally I do let the client decide. The card then becomes quite central to the suggestions delivered as the client's brought into trance, as the client's actually in, in uh, hypnosis. If you do a lot of work with tarot, you'll soon develop an understanding of each card yourself, something which helps with the suggestions you're going to deliver during the therapy. More important, though, is the way the client interprets the card. This is hypnosis after all. We want the client to go where their subconscious is going to take them. Tarot cards are very good for this, as they're so laden with metaphor and subtle meanings, as well as their very overt messaging. By the time you use a technique like this, you'll probably have seen a client a number of times. You'll have established a level of trust and know something of their background, so you can settle them down and then prepare them for hypnosis. I will sometimes give a client a card in a session, or perhaps they'll choose it themselves from a deck. And, you know, obviously I'm looking for the the way a client is going to respond to this sort of thing. So I'm being careful about who I, who I would choose to use this type of method with. But um, I'll give them a card and they will hold it as I hypnotize them. And you can use it very much the same way as you use a sort of a point of focus, whether it was a pocket watch or the end of a pen or whatever. Get them to really look at the card and picture the card perhaps even seeing themselves within the bounds of that card or relating to someone or something within the card and just gradually helping them kind of move into a place in their own mind where they shift their own perspective just a little so for example if you you can actually try this if you pick up the star which is the 17th card of the major arcana the, in the tarot and I usually use the Rider Waite deck or something which is based on it but you, if you want to find any particular card but the star is a good one to just have a little bit of an exercise with and as you begin to sort of relax and maybe allow yourself to slow down just a little bit you can look at that card the colors of it the sort of textures of that landscape and the personality of the card. And in fact, in the case of the card, there is a depiction usually of a woman at night pouring water from two vessels. She does so at night, which can be loosely associated with the idea of the subconscious. And as she pours the water, the, pour, the water is nurturing the land and it's feeding the stream. And of course, downstream, that water will bring life and all the benefits of nurturing the landscape. So as you look at that card now, and you know, the nice thing about a star is it's very much a point. You can almost imagine seeing a star in the night sky. And if you do relax, try and hold that image in your mind as your eyes close. And that image has a sort of a very natural, primal feel to it. It's very simple. And what it can often remind people of or bring to, to people is the idea of hope. And it reminds us that even in the moments of dark confusion there's a guide that leads us forward. And we're nurtured by that. We kind of need that hope. And that's really what this card is all about. In fact, if you do find your eyes are closing, or if you're looking at that card, and you're, you're really comfortable in it, the concept of hope really is something that comes through in that particular card. One of the things the card tells us is the idea that sometimes we're going to feel benefits from areas we don't even recognize. And if we have hope, we're able to do things with that. There are things in play we may not even be aware of that flow in our favor. 
And this is something when people are in crisis that really helps them. So if there were a crisis in your life, holding on to hope is going to be part of what gets you through it. Hope is a quality we all need. Where a lack of hope exists, depression follows. So whether this card reminds us to look for a positive outcome from a current situation, or that we should follow our own instinct and go towards the star, even through the confusion of the night, well, we are all reminded to look for the quality of hope and nurture it. Now, in this card, you've got this individual who's pouring water. Therapy is a little like water. We pour it into our client. And as water takes on the shape of the vessel that contains it, so the therapy takes on the shape of the client. So each therapy differs in the way that every client differs. And so, as it says on the instructions on the box, results may vary. However, when it comes to hope, we all need it. We all find it in different ways. For the optimist, it lies in the thought that things are going to be better tomorrow. For the gambler, it's the possibility that the next hands of cards may do a little better. And for three wise men, led to a stable 2,000 years ago following a star, it's the conviction that they will find the Son of God in their own salvation. Having hope is harder for some people than for others. People in crisis can find it very hard to believe that tomorrow they may be in a better situation than today. Or worse still, that tomorrow will be safer than today. But time and time again we see that when people are in crisis, if they do have a plan, if they can find hope, their outcomes are better than those who literally give up hope. We don't have to give up hope. We can find hope and hold on to it, cling on to it, as we navigate the crisis of life. And this is very much the way this star card talks to us. Let's just think about a few other religions for a moment. Obviously, the Christian traditions are very comfortable for many of us. Anyone who's grown up in the Christian faith will know that it's a part of our culture and can be supportive at many levels. There are some Christians, though, just the same as some non-Christians, who don't feel comfortable with hypnosis. This is usually based on a complete misunderstanding of what hypnosis is, and how it can help people. If you want a good laugh, watch a YouTube video called Is it okay for a Christian to be hypnotized? Hard questions. In a panel discussion, four pastors with no understanding of hypnosis discuss whether or not Christians should allow themselves to be hypnotized. It displays a monumental ignorance of the healing nature of hypnosis. But as an exercise, it's quite interesting to hear supposedly informed opinion presented by people who should know a lot better. While I'm sure we can agree that most people who present such ideas are uninformed, we also have to acknowledge that there's little to be gained in debating these issues. If someone is resistant to hypnosis because of their faith, you're probably not going to get past that. It's worth watching that video purely to hear the thoughts of people who are fearful of hypnosis. We can learn a little from this. The first thing to be aware of is that some people fear hypnosis. And the next thing is that the fear is born of ignorance. So what this tells us, and how we can use this, is to remind ourselves to explain as clearly as possible what hypnosis is. No one is taking over anybody's mind. When I work with addictions clients, I often suggest that they lean into their faith, if they have one, Christian, Jewish, Islamic, Sikh, Hindu, in any way they need to. After all, they do need all the support they can possibly get, and the fellowship of a church can be actually very helpful. Whatever support they do get from their religion or their spiritual basis is just something which helps us along. It's, that's a great thing. The golden rule, though, is don't get engaged in arguments about this stuff. 
If you recognize this client doesn't want to bring their religious views to the table, then respect their wishes and allow them to figure it out for themselves. I could talk for hours about how some Christian rituals lean on many techniques that are hypnotic in nature. But this isn't really the focus of this presentation, so I'm not going to get into that. I come from a small island in England, though I now live in Canada. In a forest glade not far from the farm on which I grew up, there is an arrangement of stones, one of which is called the Long Stone. This was likely an altar on which Druids offered sacrifices to their deities. The idea that the life of some poor virgin was sacrificed in spring so that the harvest would be fruitful is quite disturbing, not least for the virgin. But people sometimes forget that our Christian ideas of Easter are firmly rooted in the Druidic beliefs that were practiced in many European countries long before the arrival of Christianity. There's a lot of crossover. For my North American friends, I should explain that the Druids were a religion long before Christianity arrived in English shores, and more recent beliefs such as Wicca draw on some of these ideas. My English friends are probably aware that human sacrifice was practiced well into the second century in England. And for my friends in Essex, a virgin is a person that's still physically innocent. Here in Canada, I'm pleased to say we do embrace all religions equally. Having said that, I don't really get to meet many Druids here, and generally speaking, human sacrifice is definitely frowned upon. Before I wrap up this presentation, I should ask you to come to robhadley.ca to see some of the training modules I have on offer. I also offer a training module called a Master Group to help you support your best clients with an ongoing program for just $25 a month. Have a look if you're interested in some of the ideas I've talked about and see if it's right for you. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. It's time for me to wrap it up now, so I'll say goodnight and may your God go with you, whoever she is.